Good afternoon, everyone. How are you today? It's Greg Mackling here, host of 680 CGOB's morning show, The Start. I have two co-hosts, Brett McGarry and Loren McNabb. They are not with me today, but they fully endorse me being with you today. So uh, thanks for spending some time with us. We want to welcome you to the Health Report 2.0, Season 2.0. And whether you joined us last year or you're a first timer, today we kick off a new slate of leaders in medicine in conversation with friends of St. B. So, to all the friends of St. B, thanks for being a friend. And to everyone that's taking time out of their schedule to be with us today, we appreciate you immensely. We want to let you know that today's conversation is being recorded on Treaty 1 territory, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and we are on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties made on these territories. We acknowledge harms and mistakes, and we dedicate ourselves to collaborate in partnership with First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples in the spirit of reconciliation. February is, of course, our shortest month, often our coldest month of the year across Canada and here in Manitoba. And of course, across the country, we celebrate and recognize Heart Month. We all know cardiovascular health is important. And chances are you are or you know, or you may be one of the millions of Canadians affected by heart disease. What you might not know is how heart attack symptoms vary widely by gender, by age, and no matter what the symptoms, time is always of the essence to get to St. Boniface Hospital for treatment. And why do we mention St. Boniface specifically? Well, we're going to learn more from our guest today, who is among the talented and caring people who make St. Boniface Hospital Manitoba's cardiac center of excellence. Dr. Shuang Bo Lu is an interventional cardiologist, a clinician, scientist, an assistant professor with the University of Manitoba, and a champion for women's heart health. Now, just to let you know before we doc bring Dr. Lu on, we will speak for about a half an hour and then we'll have about 15 minutes for your questions. As a viewer, your camera is off and you are on mute you'll be able to type your questions into the chat box at any time during our conversation. So now without further ado, please join me in, walking, in welcoming, pardon me, Dr. Shuangbo Lu. That was rhyming a, a little bit there, Dr. Lu. So I, I got excited there. I like rhymes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So why don't we jump right into this? Because uh, I love celebrating repatriated Manitobans. I'm a thrice- repatriated Manitoba and I left my hometown, my home province three times only to come back. You grew up in Winnipeg, you trained here before building your career with hospitals in Ontario. You decided to come back to Manitoba in September of 2020. Why don't you tell us what brought you back to Winnipeg and to St. Boniface Hospital? Okay, um, I'm glad to hear that we already have found something that we have in common. I think that uh, it was, you know, it's a bit of a cliche, but it was a no brainer decision for me to come back to Winnipeg. It's always felt like home. Um, I did my undergraduate degree in medical school at the University of Manitoba. And then I also did my uh, internal medicine as well as cardiology training here. So I spent most of my life in Winnipeg. Um, and then I went to Toronto for three years to pursue interventional cardiology training and a research degree. When I was looking for a job to come back, I feel extremely fortunate that I was able to connect with my previous mentors and people that supported me throughout my training and uh, who, who have welcomed me back with open arms. Um, Winnipeg feels like home. I think there's no other way to put it. I feel comfortable. I feel welcome. It is nice to walk through the hospital and see people that um, I have known since I was a medical student uh, who have seen me grow up and train and um, a lot of colleagues and friends are here. I think that both the University of Manitoba with the Department of Internal Medicine and the Cardiac Sciences Program at St. Boniface Hospital, they really work together to make me feel like my 
they would support me in achieving what I wanted out of my career and how I wanted to help patients. Ultimately, I think my family is here, my friends are here, and um, I can't say enough about how nice it is to be able to drive only 20 minutes to get to work, regardless of the time of the day, compared to being stuck on the highway in Toronto. Yeah, that uh, time in the vehicle, it, it adds up quickly. And yes, of course, we're in the middle of this unprecedented winter in some respects with the snow and the cold. It's a, it's a trade-off, isn't it? It is. The summers are so beautiful. And last summer, I spent so much of my downtime just sitting outside in the backyard and enjoying the beautiful summer nights that I almost feel like the winter is worth it. Not quite this week. Every morning, I, you know, as I'm walking just across the street from the parquet to the hospital, I'm thinking, did I make the right choice? My hands are freezing. My face is freezing. But it's really the people. It's, you know, the St. Boniface Hospital um, everyone that works here, the foundation has been so welcoming and encouraging as I start my career. It ultimately feels like the right choice. Well, I've been a friend of the foundation for a decade now. And one thing that I've found very much in common, in particular with the uh, physicians who are also researchers such as yourself, Dr. Liu, that affinity for the research center and that ability to not only practice medicine, but to see the value and to see your research and sort of be inspired by your patients to do better research. So maybe talk about how the two, you know, the two processes are intertwined and, and am I off track by suggesting you fall in that same category and maybe just talk about your affinity for the research center overall. Yeah, so I have a personal connection to the research center um, because my dad, who is a scientist, actually worked there for many years as I was growing up. I think I must have been in middle school at that time, and I remember celebrating um, the holidays at uh, the Chris um, at the research center. There would be Santa Claus. I would get presents. I remember running around inside that you know, this weird green building with all of the glass. So I have very fond memories of the research center of St. Boniface Hospital, because I really feel like it, um, it played a big part in my development and played a big part in, you know, the type of doctor that I am. So that's a special kind of mentorship. So maybe, you know, I know you also have, you know, Dr. Dukas is a very close yes. connection and, and a mentor. But talk about the value, you know, I always think of the youth bio lab when I think about the research center and the young people that that space in particular has the ability to inspire and have folks think about young people think about what the future might look like for them and a connection to medical research or medicine or just research, some variation of that combination. And just have, you know, being around your dad and and having him as a mentor, as a, as a trailblazer, that's pretty special. I think definitely, and you touch on something so important to me, which is mentorship. I've been fortunate in, um, in all aspects of my career to have found mentors and people that believe in me. And I think it is so important, whether it is a, a, you know, a teenager in high school or someone like me who's starting my career to have people that I could turn to who I know will give me the time and spend their energy and spend the effort to help me develop and become a better person and a better physician, a better researcher. Um, there are um, definitely a lot of mentors at the University of Manitoba, even within my own section, who have played a major role in, in even me choosing to become a cardiologist. So I'm now trying to pay it forward, and I'm involved in mentorship programs both at the Doctors Manitoba and at the university level. Um, I often have students as young as high school students to medical students, and I'm hoping to have a master's student in the fall because, I, and I see myself not just as a supervisor, but as a mentor. And there is, I think, a, a difference between the two because a supervisor is someone you have maybe for a project, a course, whereas a mentor is someone you can develop this relationship with and know that even if they no longer work with me for research, they can reach out for me for questions, for you know, life advice. And I really, I think because I've benefited so much from mentors in my career, I really wanna pay it forward. And even if I can show one person what it is like to, you know, to be a researcher, to develop that passion for medicine, it's a good day. Wow, I can, I can hear that, I can feel, I can see the gratitude of, of that experience for you. So 
sometimes uh, you give back by by paying it forward. I, I love that. Uh, I love that knowledge, and and I love that. I love that concept. So let's dig in a little bit deeper into to what it is you do for a living. I, I don't know how how deep you get into this when you're out at a cocktail party. So what do you do? <laughs> and maybe yeah. uh, stop at interventional interventional cardiologist. But for those that are really interested, and that's our viewers today, what is your area of focus and and what is the role of an interventional cardiologist? Because that first word, maybe we're not as familiar with as that second one. Yeah, it's um, a, a very long title, but to put it simply as one of my mentor, uh, Dr. Jassel, who you have met as he always says, I'm a heart plumber. And I, I take that as a compliment because plumbers obviously do a very important job, but to put it very simply, um, I use um, it, it, interventional cardiology is a branch of cardiology where we use small flexible tubes to go into the arteries of the heart and we open blockages. We use balloons and small metal meshes uh, called stents to open these blockages and restore blood flow. That can mean different things depending on where I'm meeting the patient. It could mean that if someone has been having chest pain every time they walk up a set of stairs, I'm able to go in, open the blockage causing that and help give them their quality of life back, let them go curling, go dancing and pick up and play with their grandchildren. It could also mean when someone is having a life threatening or devastating heart attack with sudden onset of chest discomfort, they come straight to me. I get up at three in the morning when it's minus 40 out, I rush to the hospital so that we can open the blockage and stop the heart attack. So I think to put it simply, a heart plumber is not incorrect. Um, it is a, a very a unique, but I think a very, um, a very inspiring field. And I feel so grateful that I get to do something that I love because ultimately it, um, when someone comes into the hospital, they're cold, they're sweaty, they're feeling unwell, they're having a heart attack. And I open the blockage, stop the heart attack. And then they go home in three days. They, I see them in clinic a month later and they're a different person. They say, doc, I've been able to do things I haven't done in weeks or months or years and that feeling that that um, happiness that it brings me never quite goes away I would say interventional cardiology is plays a big role in what I do and a lot of my passion with research comes from my work as a clinician because it's tied together I feel fortunate that I can identify a problem in the patients that I see on the you know, in the hospital, in clinic, or in the cath lab where we do the procedures. And I have the research skills to be able to address those questions. And ultimately, I think the most important thing is to do that knowledge translation and bring it back to the patient to improve their outcome. My Love clinical it. work, go ahead. I was just going to say, if this doctor thing doesn't work out for you, you might have a, a future in broadcasting because <laughs> you were working a, a segue very weaving it very nicely to my next question. And that had to do with your research focus. So yeah. uh, maybe we're, maybe we're uh, already connecting on a different level here, Dr. Lou. So I don't can know you if give I us can an get... overview of your research since you were already answering the question I was about to ask you? I don't know if I can get up as early as you do on a regular basis. <laughs> I, that may be the rate limiting step in, uh, in this new career. Fair um, enough. But I think definitely my research and my clinical work, I tied so closely together. I like to do research that I know can impact my patients, can impact future patients. And so I really have two different areas that I'm interested in, and I love both of them, so I refuse to narrow it down. One of them is women's heart health, and I think that's one of the reasons that we are here. There are unique conditions that present um, more so in uh, women compared to men. One of them, something I'm, I'm very excited about is called spontaneous coronary artery dissection or SCAD for short. It is a tear in the artery of the heart. Most heart attacks are caused by blockages, cholesterol that has built up and prevents the blood flow. Whereas with SCAD, it is more so the tear occurs and blood is starting to go in the wrong direction, not supplying the muscle. It's still a heart attack, but it occurs more so in young, healthy people. The average age is probably 40 or 45 years old. Um, the ratio of female to male is about nine to one. And most of these patients are healthy. They run marathons. They do CrossFit. They are living healthy, normal lives when this 
this event happens and completely changes their lives. It's a fairly new condition. There's so much we don't know about it. And I really hope that I can dedicate my career to this to help add some understanding, improve the treatment and the outcomes of SCAD patients. The other part, the other pillar of my research and clinical interest is overall just heart attacks. How can we diagnose heart attacks better? How can we help patients navigate this journey after heart attacks better? Um, what is the role of peer intervention, having a peer support group? What is the psychological effect of having heart attacks? And I think the last thing that I want to say is that, again, being able to have the clinical knowledge, have the research skill and the infrastructure to be able to make a difference in the heart attack patients is really what brought me back to Manitoba. Wow, what a terrific answer there. And we're going to get into just the importance of getting to hospital quickly, very quickly here. But on the SCAD, you mentioned a ratio of nine to one. Is that nine men to every one woman or nine no. women to every one man? So 90% um, female compared to 10% men for SCAD. Whereas, as you know, by, by the look on your face, that um, normal, I shouldn't call it normal, but atherosclerotic or cholesterol-based heart attacks are more male dominant. So this is why it's such a unique condition. And it has a lot of, um, not a lot of people understand it. Some physicians and definitely a lot of the public may not have heard of it. And so therefore it can be very isolating for patients. So if you imagine on a ward unit of 30 patients that are having heart attacks, there may only be one patient such as this. And so a lot of the teaching material, a lot of the things that we know about heart attacks may not apply to them. And so I'm actually very, very excited. And maybe we can revisit this in the future, but um, we are working on peer support where if there is a patient with this, one of the SCAD survivors is willing to come into the hospital to talk to them and show them there is life after this. And you also mentioned the fact that this is new. I'm guessing here that this has been happening since the beginning of time. We've just realized that it was happening and happening in women predominantly. So were, were women dying with this condition of this affliction um, without any understanding that that was what was taking their life? I think that's a really great question and there's no straightforward answer. One of the reasons why women's heart health has really come to the forefront recently is because we have better technology. We have better lab tests before. Um, it was not unusual that very small heart attacks or very minimal heart damage may not have been picked up. Whereas now all of these are being picked up and sometimes it can be quite subtle. So our testing is better. Our, um, our angiograms, which are the x-ray films where we do uh, the interventional procedures to put in stents and open blockages, that technology is also better. We're able to put small cameras inside of the actual arteries to see what is happening. So definitely the diagnosis rate is going up. And I think that I, I completely agree. It's very possible this has been happening for many years and we just were not aware of it. But now we're all trained to look for it so that we can treat it appropriately because definitely the treatment and the outcome is different. You mentioned uh, that, that plumber analogy, uh, another check mark there because a lot of the plumbers now have cameras at the end of their yes. augers now to show you, hey, we actually did something today and that's why I'm charging you 250 bucks. So there's <laughs> another comparison there. Yeah. It's so earlier we touched on yeah, I have a habit to go in a variety of places, Dr. Lou. So thanks for your patience on that. Uh, earlier, we touched on that importance of getting to St. Boniface Hospital quickly if you're experiencing heart, heart attack symptoms. I was having a, 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 a conversation with my boys yesterday. One of my boys got their uh, braces off and he was most forward, looking most forward to not having these cuts on the inside of his mouth. But he made an interesting observation about how quickly the inside of the mouth heals. And that remind me, you mentioned Dr. Jassel. I think it was from Dr. Jassel I learned a decade ago that that's the only muscle that doesn't regenerate, doesn't repair itself after it's been damaged in the case of a heart attack or otherwise. So, you know, that whole time is muscle thing. Is, is, is that a, a part of this discussion that we're having today about time being critical to get to hospital? Yes, definitely 100%. And I'm, I'm so glad to have this platform to share this information. So for people that don't know, when a heart attack happens, an artery within the heart becomes blocked. 
blood is not able to go down to where it needs to go. When that artery is blocked, the muscle that it's supposed to supply slowly starts dying. I shouldn't even say slowly. From the second the artery becomes blocked, the muscle cells start dying. And that's what causes the pain and the discomfort that people are having. It's um, literally the, the, the cells. Yes. Yeah. Dying. And that's what releases a lot of the enzymes that we measure for the heart attacks. It's, it happens very quickly. It can be quite sudden. There are also types of heart attacks where it's not a, as life-threatening, but we're always trying to treat all heart attacks in a timely fashion because we don't know what type it is until we actually make the diagnosis. Our, our key when somebody has a heart attack where the artery is completely blocked is to restore blood flow as quickly as possible. And so that's where this time is muscle uh, saying comes from. For every second, every minute, every hour that the artery remains blocked, there's damage to the heart. And the patients are at higher risk for having a poor outcome. And a poor outcome can mean different things. But for example, we know that for every hour this artery remains blocked, there's a 10% increased chance of having severe heart damage or even dying from it. Maybe for reiterate other people, that. That's, that's a startling number. For that, that, every that percentage, hour. That incremental increase yes. per hour. Just sort of For every hour. Yeah. Okay. I'm just so excited about this. Sorry. Um, no, every... no, I am as well. And, and I think this, the, the numbers are probably startling to a lot of people. For every hour that the artery remains completely blocked from the life-threatening heart attack, there's a 10% increased risk of severe heart damage or even dying. Wow. Sometimes if the artery is not completely blocked, patients can still have a poor outcome because a poor outcome means different things to different people. For some, it may mean not being able to go back to work. Uh, for others, it may mean not be able to, to go dancing, to go traveling. It may mean different things. And so this is a, such a key message, something we're so passionate about. We share this with our patients when they come to the hospital with a heart attack. We tell them, if you ever have chest pain again, you need to go seek medical attention, dial 911. However, now we hope to share it more broadly with more people to help encourage them to seek medical attention sooner rather than waiting. So along with Dr. John Dukas, who you have um, met, and also with uh, Dr. Lorraine Avery, who is a clinical nurse specialist, we are starting this Dial Don't Drive campaign as part of the Manitoba ACS network. So our network is a, our goal is to improve uh, care for heart attack patients in the province. And next week on uh, Monday, February 28th, the last day of heart month, we're formally launching the campaign. But we have already taken to social media on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to promote the launch so that people can understand why this is such an important message. There are a lot of reasons why the campaign is important to the general public. The first reason, and again, here comes the numbers. The first reason is that by calling 911 compared to presenting to the emergency department, patients are diagnosed with life-threatening heart attacks three times faster. If we don't make that diagnosis, we can't treat the heart attack. So that's the first step. And the reason for this is not because our emergency, our emergency departments are not doing a good job, but it's because as soon as you call 911, the operator starts assessing the patient. They ask questions, they give advice. And as soon as the paramedic gets to um, where the patient is, they start treating. So there's a zero time delay to treatment if someone is having this serious heart attack. And another startling fact, which I just recently learned within the last few months as we really dug into this, is that one in 18 patients with this type of life-threatening heart attack can have a cardiac arrest when they're driving to the hospital. That means that their heart could stop. And this can be very catastrophic, very, I think, traumatizing for anyone else who is there. And also I think a public concern. So there are a lot of reasons to call 911. I'm gonna share one more. Sure. One more reason is that Manitoba has the worst rate of ambulance use worth the serious heart attack. There was a study that came out showing in 2007 to 2012, only 46% of patients with this type of heart attack actually called 911. The rest drove to the hospital. And we also looked at more local and recent data to see if this has changed. But in 2018 to 2020, only 53% called uh, 911 with this type of heart attack. Now, this is compared to 70% or higher in other provinces such as Alberta or Nova Scotia. 
So this is why the goals of the Dial Don't Drive campaign are to save lives and to help us understand what is the best way to do that. We want to decrease the delay in patients coming to for help because if they don't come, we can't help them. We want to increase the number of patients that are calling 911 by sharing this message with them. And ultimately, of course, we want to improve how they do, what their outcome is, and their quality of life because they're being diagnosed and treated faster. Yeah, I think so many people don't realize your treatment when you take yourself or somebody takes you to hospital doesn't start until you get past that triage nurse. Whereas when you call 911, as you say, that that path, that road to care, excuse me, and that treatment essentially begins immediately. So what gets in the way? What contributes to those statistics of Manitobans in particular, since we're here in Manitoba, what gets in the way? Psychological issues? Is it something else that prevents us from picking up that phone, even though we know in the back of our head, or maybe it's really obvious, something just isn't right? I think... You know, once we started thinking about this campaign, which has been a year in the making, we really try to learn more about what are these barriers, because that will help us build a better campaign. So the first thing is that most people wait at least two to three hours before they come. Many wait for more than that, six, seven, eight hours, days, and some never come. So when we really look into this and we have research ongoing for this, um, is some people don't know this whole concept of time as muscle. They, they just, it hasn't come across uh, this idea. So they're not aware of how important time is. Other people often think it's not serious. It's going to get better on its own. And I think what really makes me um, want to change this is that people are embarrassed. People say, what if it was not serious. What if it's a false alarm? I don't want to be a bother. Mm -hmm. Other people may interpret the symptom as not being related to the heart. Um, often we say, oh, I thought it was just heartburn, just a muscle ache. So I didn't think much of it because not every heart attack will present as the very severe, I think I'm going to die, heavy pressure on my chest. It may be a little bit more subtle. It may be pain that comes and goes. It may be more, um, more arm or jaw um, pain or heaviness. So a lot of the times people may misinterpret or misunderstand their symptoms. But I think the one I really want to influence is they're afraid, they're embarrassed, they don't want to seek help because they don't want to bother other people. And I really hope that through the campaign, not only can we educate the general public that time is muscle, and that we are always here to help. Our doors are always open. And it's so important that for them to seek medical attention sooner, because otherwise, we can't help them. One way we're trying to do this through our campaign is something called patient voices. So I come across um, and interact with heart attack patients all the time. So I now start regularly asking, when, what made you decide to call? Why didn't you call? And um, a lot of the patients want to share their stories. They want to share their journeys. They want to share why they did not call or why they did call. And I think that is so important because I could talk for days, but that is never as meaningful as a patient sharing their perspective. So I'm, I'm super excited about the campaign and I can't wait for everyone to see it. You know, uh, one of my best friends, I, I think I touched on this when we spoke on the radio yesterday, mm -hmm. one of my best friends out West, he's a, just a bit older than I am, but he's fit as a fiddle. Uh, he's a teacher, he's very active and just found out uh, that he had an 80% blockage in one of his arteries. And he ignored some, what he considered, you know, unusual, but he categorized it as minor chest pain. And so he didn't seek attention right away. And, you know, his perspective on, geez, I should have called sooner, I think is a valuable one to share for sure. And I think the other side is, you know, you're not immune just because you're 55 year old guy that can run a half marathon without breaking a sweat. You're not, you're, you're, that doesn't guarantee you of anything. Yeah. Fair to say. I think that's very fair to say. And that's, I think another 
misunderstanding or misconception about this type of heart attack. These very serious heart attack where the artery occludes completely can happen to anyone at any time. And through these patient voices, we're sharing patients of all different ages, um, all, from all different backgrounds, because it can just strike like lightning. It's not something that we can predict with complete accuracy. And that's why it's so important that if something new, a new discomfort, a new pain, something that's serious, stopping you in your tracks, something that is not going away that you can't explain, you need to seek help. So that dial don't drive message quite often. Uh, it's as much about educating the public as much as it is about the prof professionals around you. So talk about how that's, you know, becoming a new skill set for healthcare professionals, uh, whether they're a cardiologist, family doctors, uh, other healthcare practitioners in the province that might be, might be speaking to us, might be seeing us on a more regular basis. You know, as much as I like you, I don't necessarily want to meet you at work, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, I will... Uh... That's okay. I think I'm okay with that. Um, I think definitely education and communication skills with um, being able to develop that relationship with our patients is very important. And doctors have been doing it regularly, um, whether it is through one-on-one -on -one visits with um, one-on-one -on -one visits with um, a family doctor or a specialist, or if it is forums like this where we have the opportunity to to uh, educate on a broader level. However, I think. Um, what we're trying to do with the Dial Don't Drive campaign is a new frontier for me and uh, perhaps for a lot of other uh, healthcare professionals because I think social media is such an important educational tool. People spend a lot of time on it. And if I'm able to share this message and even help one person understand why time is muscle, why call 911, then I feel that we've done our job. Um, I am uh, learning on the fly. In the last couple of weeks, I've made a website. I started an Instagram account. I started a Facebook account. I figured out Twitter. I am uh, not going to tackle TikTok. I feel like that's my limit right there, which oh, may say on. something about my age. Are you on TikTok? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, see? <laughs> but I'd like to see you try it. Well, Maybe, should we both you know, do it? I'll follow you. You'll follow me. Yeah. That, okay. We'll make a pledge. We'll make okay. a pledge. All right, we'll try that. Um, so it's, uh, but it is fun. I will say it is extremely fun and I'm doing it because it lets us reach a broader audience, right? Yeah. And I think that is so important. We have, uh, don't, um, uh, don't be surprised if you see some of uh, the healthcare professionals doing dances on Instagram. We have a couple Good. of fun videos that we have made. Um, but I'm not doing it alone. I have an amazing support team, the shared health uh, communications team, Sarah and Alex have taught me a lot of things. Um, we have a cardiology resident, Dr. Marshall, who is helping me to brainstorm some of these posts. She's a great uh, patient educator. Um, I have a medical student, um, Haram, and a, um, a PharmD student, Emily, and we're working together. We meet regularly, we order some food, we talk about it, um, socially distanced or uh, on, on Zoom, just to clarify. And we, we feed off each other's energy because we're all so passionate about this. Um, I, um, I, I, I'm, I'm definitely learning and I think it's about time. It's an important tool. It's mm -hmm. a powerful tool. And you can find us online, uh, MBACS Network, the website, the Instagram, the Facebook, the Twitter, everything is the same. And we have posts about the team heart attack to show the public, every single person who may be involved in taking care of a heart attack patient. It's over 40 or 50 people in different roles that are doing this. So it's really a large group of um, a large group of people. And the patient voices, as I've mentioned, we have educational posts. What's a heart attack? What is a stent? Why do I have to, you know, treat my diabetes? How does high blood pressure relate this? What's a positive family history? We do medication Mondays, the last Monday of each month. Our um, PharmD student, Emily, will be discussing one of the cardiac medications, one of the heart medications, and we'll keep doing that. We have Q&A sessions planned. I may even do an Instagram live. Um, so we'll see how it goes. It's, um, it's, I will say, it really just has been a lot of fun. We, um, I really enjoy it. That's wonderful. Yeah, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, Saturday morning cartoons. And if you're of a certain age, everybody knew Stop, Drop and Roll and Mr. Yuck and only you can prevent forest fires. So 
when it's catchy and it's repeated over and over yeah. again, it's something that can become a turn of phrase, something that people, you know, remember in a time that they need it. So I, I commend you for your efforts. And, and, and I think that the more that we just kind of drive it out there, the, the more commonplace it'll be. I, I want to ask you one more quick question. Although it's it, it's impossible to to calculate or predict how long your answer might be on this, but the value of of donors and how their support makes a difference. Uh, my good friend Dr. Gordon Glazner, who's not from Winnipeg, but he, he it's his home now, talks about when he was recruited to the to the research center. Gosh, it's got to be twenty plus years ago now, and he realized that when he's in the Safeway. The people that he's standing next to in the grocery line might be supporting his research, and and that was really powerful to him. So that that incredible work that the community does to ensure that world class research is happening at the research center is 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 a sort of a Manitoba thing, isn't it, Dr. Lou? I think it really is, and it speaks to the friendliness and the, um, I think the open nature of Manitobans. I, I will share that when I came back in September of 2020, I, I knew I was going to be a clinician scientist. 50% of my time was dedicated to research, but I didn't know how to get started. And that's when the, the university stepped in and the St. Boniface Hospital Foundation stepped in. An anonymous donor supported my research. They read a paragraph about my interest in women's heart health and they were a, they made a donation and that let me hit the ground running. I was able to start doing uh, projects and research initiatives. I was able to start to uh, recruit patients to hire personnel so that I could just go and answer the questions that are important to the patients that I care for. And I think one thing um, that donors may not understand is what happens to their donations, right? They go on the website, they click on a bunch of things, magically the money leaves their account. But I can definitely say it's going to the right place. It's going to the initiatives, the projects that would not be doable without their support. And I think I, I'm an excellent example of that because if I did not have the support of the, uh, the anonymous donor when I started, it would have taken me months to a year or two to be able to get grant funding to make myself competitive. Whereas now we are already doing impactful research that ultimately improved the care of Manitobans. And I think the DDD campaign, Dial Don't Drive, is a key collaborative that also highlights this. You are right, you're not gonna be able to cut me off. It'll be one before we know it. Um, but the DDD campaign, it, it happened organically. We looked at our local data, at our, um, our key performance indicators. We're like, wait a second, why are we not doing better? Why are patients coming later? How can we help this? And it grew as a collaboration between the uh, Manitoba ACS network, the Heart Attack Network, Shared Health, and the St. Boniface Hospital Foundation. We're all partners in this. And I think that the goal of the campaign is really quite simple. We want to save lives. We want to know what's the best way to do that. And that's where the donation is going. And as a donor to support this cause, you are helping to save lives of heart attack patients. And you are helping us to figure out what is the best way to do that. And I don't know what could be more powerful than that. Um, I think there's there are amazing research projects that are happening at St. Boniface Hospital, at the research center. We're all passionate about what we do. And I think that's the other thing that donors should know that we will carry this through. We will see this through. We will keep going at this. And that's why it's a social media campaign. Although you will see our, uh, our poster on the back of every ambulance. You will hear me on every radio station that will invite me on wherever it is that I can share this message. Um, but the social media campaign will keep going because it is something that is going to, I think, reach the broader audience, be able to have that impact long-term as opposed yep. to something that may be more short term. And that's yeah, what know, do, the donation is supporting. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, 911 started in Winnipeg in North America, first city to do that three digit dialing for emergency. So, you know, the DDD dial don't drive. One of our uh, viewers here asking, is this a Winnipeg initiative or across Manitoba? I think I can answer this is in Winnipeg, Manitoba. This, because it's on social media, it has the power to 
to be North American wide. It has the power to be world. world. Right? Yeah, for sure. We're so a lot of our efforts right now are local because we have limited funding. We have um, limited people, but we recently have received some grant funding from the Manitoba Medical um, Services Foundation and through the section of cardiology. So you will see billboards, you will see bus ads, you will see us in the Winnipeg Free Press, you will see um, we're going to be giving out uh, postcards, fridge magnets, pins, everything with this message. We're translating the message into different languages because we want to leave no one out. Right. Wow. We are going to church groups, ethnocultural groups, senior associations, pharmacies. Next time you pick up your medication, maybe there will be a pill container there with Dow Don't Drive on it. And that's also where the donation is going, because we really want to make this as successful as we can. We want to have the power to create this change in Winnipeg, in Manitoba and in North America, in the world. But we're focusing on our patients first. And that's where a lot of the current efforts are. The first phase is going to be Winnipeg centric, but we will be reaching out to the rest of the province. We're working with different regional health authorities, with different groups to make sure we're excluding no one. That's, that's wonderful. Now, we also have somebody asking for you to reiterate, to share with us again, where we can connect on the social media. Yeah, so on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, just search for MBACS Network, and you'll find us. We also have a website, which is also mbacsnetwork.ca. And that at the top will have all of the links to the social media. I just created the website on a weekend. I apologize if it's not um, 2022, but um, well, as I'm learning- What else did you have to do but create a website? Sorry? What else did you have to do but create a website? I know. In between it's, um, saving lives. I'm, I'm sitting there. I'm not on call. I'm probably post-call. I'm, I'm actually quite productive when I'm post-call and sleep deprived, but I'm sitting there because Dr. Dukas said, are you sure you know how to do it? And uh, that was all the encouragement that I need to prove that I think I can do it. I've had a lot of help. I've had a lot of support. And I think that is so important because everyone that we are working with this, um, working on with this, including all the ones I mentioned before, the paramedics, Winnipeg Fire Paramedic Services, everyone believes in this message. It is a important message. And I, I, I'm so excited. I cannot wait until Monday when everything goes live. So we have a, a question here from one of our viewers. It might be a little bit of a longer answer, but is there, is there a um, concise way for us to share what the differences are between SCAD and other MLS? Oh, MIs. Thank you uh, for um, my support staff here uh, with the M MIs. MI standing for? Um, myocardial infarction, heart attack. Oh, gee whiz. Yeah. Okay, there you go. I'm learning more by the minute. What was the first part of the question? A concise the difference way to between SCAD. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So a traditional uh, cholesterol-based heart attack often happen in patients who do have some risk factors, such as smoking, high blood pressure, or cholesterol problems, but not always. Um, and that is because the, it's more of a cholesterol-based problem where it builds up in the arteries and lead to a blockage. Whereas spontaneous coronary artery dissections, the arteries are actually normal in the way that there's no cholesterol built up. However, it can have a tear. Um, there are three layers to the artery inside of the heart, each of the arteries, and one of them can tear and a blood clot, um, a blood collection can occur behind it. And that um, occludes the blood flow, prevents the blood from going where it's needed. So the method of that type of heart attack happening is very different. Um, SCAD does cause a heart attack, so it falls within that same umbrella. It's just the way that it causes a heart attack is different, and therefore how it's treated is also different. How does it get, how, how do you treat it uh, ultimately? So if we can, we actually leave it alone. If there is enough oh, really? blood flow and the patient is not having ongoing chest pain, we give it time. And this is one of the, the most amazing things about SCAD, which is most SCAD heal on their own. If before, when we first discovered this, we used to do routine angiograms, repeat the test to see if it has healed. And we saw that the majority of them do heal by 
nine months to a year. So with medication, certain lifestyle changes, and just time for your body to heal, most of the time we have a good outcome. There are exceptions. Um, and that is what my clinic is dedicated to. I'm doing a, a clinic after this conversation and most of my patients in clinic are SCAD patients. And um, I think it, it is something that I also want to focus and do more education on both for healthcare professionals um, as well as uh, for the general public because it's just not as well known. We have uh, somebody asking, I think this is maybe born out of the pandemic and the situation we find ourselves in right now in terms of challenges with regards to capacity issues, mm -hmm. being the cardiac center of excellence, have current capacity issues elsewhere in the system affected whether or not cardiac patients continue to come to St. D, Dr. Lou? Yeah, we were very worried about this because during the pandemic, there were quite a few um, publications or reports that came out saying patients were delaying to seek a care when they were having heart attacks. Patients just weren't coming. And that didn't make sense because the, the average rate of heart attack is not going to change, but it um, people just weren't coming. But now what we're seeing is perhaps people are coming later, having already suffered that heart attack days or weeks or months before. I think what there are, um, I think, you know, we could always do better. There, the system could always be more efficient and we're constantly working at that. But I want to reassure the people that are listening that if you are having a serious life-threatening heart attack, your care will not be compromised. There will always be a team that is on call to take care of you. Um, there will be a doctor, a nurse, whoever is needed. And there will be a hospital bed for the patients that need it. Uh, for this serious type of heart attack. And that shouldn't be a reason for people not to come in. Yeah, I think that's a great piece of advice. Uh, maybe the last one here as we, as we hit our uh, time post here, ASA. And if you think you're having a heart attack, aspirin, the baby aspirin, all that, all those different things that we've been told over the years, what's the advice there currently? So I don't know if you, um, have time to watch TV, but I was um, watching TV one day and I saw a Bayer commercial for aspirin. So I think that message is definitely out there, but I, I, would, um, I would say this is why we should call 911 because that 911 operator will go through the algorithm. They will help you decide what to do, whether you should take it, whether you shouldn't take it. And this, one of my patients said it best, when you call 911, the hospital comes to you. Yeah. And that just resonates with me. It's so powerful, right? You pick up the phone, you dial these three digits and someone is immediately there to take care of you, to help you through this. I think it's difficult for a patient sometimes when they're in pain to decide what should I do? Do I take it? Do I not take it? And that's why they're trained healthcare professionals to help and um, call 911. We will help you figure that part out. And the hospital is ready to come to your home anytime. Don't worry about the production. My Bob always said, why do they have to come with the, with the fire truck and the yes. ambulance and all everybody can, because it's the quickest, you it's the most it. you efficient need, way. And yeah. we don't want anything to happen to you, Baba. Dial the number, worry about the bill later. You know, I know that's part of the conversation potentially down the road as well, yes. but yeah, dial, 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 911. Do not drive yourself. Don't have somebody else drive you because yeah, that, that magic, you know, this computer that everybody carries around with them now, you know, the, the paramedics have one too, and they can connect yes. to you before you even leave your house to have an yeah. idea of what's happening be, be, to me before I even get in the back of that ambulance. Yes. And, and if you don't call, you can't take advantage of that miracle of technology. Yeah, I, that's such an important point because when the patient, if you're having chest pain and you call 911, they do the heart tracing and the paramedics thinks, hey, this person may be having a 100% blockage, the life-threatening heart attack. There's always a doctor on call. It's made, the, the team is made up of cardiologists, heart doctors, and emergency physicians. And we get the ECG, the heart tracing, transmit it to us. And we look at it and we say, yep, that's the kind of heart attack that we need to treat right away. And then as you are being rushed to the hospital, the team is rushing in and we meet you in the cath lab where the procedure is done. Um, and 
that artery will be open as soon as possible because we have this code STEMI pro, um, uh, code STEMI program set up this way because time is muscle. Call nine one one. We are here to help. And uh, I could say that a million more times, but you may want to cut me off before that. Dial, don't drive. That's the message. Share it with your friends. It's uh, very important. The magic of technology, the healthcare system comes to you. I've never heard it put so succinctly. I'm going to put that one in my kit bag, Dr. Lou. Thank you so much for this engaging conversation. Thank you for what you do as, an, as, a, as a cardiologist, as an interventional cardiologist, as a researcher, and then as a web developer and, and a guru of all things social media in your spare time. Thanks for creating this initiative, spearheading it and, and making it uh, ultimately, I believe, just part of the part of the everyday vernacular here in Manitoba. Thanks for this. Thanks so much, Greg. And thanks to the St. Boniface Hospital Foundation for giving me this opportunity. That, uh, that was actually extremely fun. And I could talk to you for days. Well, we'll, uh, we'll connect again. I promise you, you want to be TikTok on the radio, video, I can right? make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> thanks again, Dr. Lou. And thanks for, to everyone, for our friends online today, to our friends here at Bounce for producing today's event. Dr. Lou and I have been separated by a vast distance, but of course that technology bridges that distance. And you might've been under the impression we were kind of just really close to one another. And thanks for making the effort to be with us. And we look forward to connecting with you again. Watch your inbox for the details on our next Health Report 2.0. And on behalf of St. Boniface Hospital Foundation, I want to thank you for your support and thank you for spending some time with us today. I'm Greg Mackling. Have a wonderful Thursday.